voting on May 18. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Rivera. And we're going to go to Commissioner Kevin Barnhart. I want to note again, Commissioner Barnhart has been leading uh, the elections board every year, except the year we've run for re-election uh, since he was first elected back in 2008. Uh, he has a great team, and I am looking forward to hearing the program today. Commissioner Kevin Barnhart. Thank you to my colleagues, uh, Commissioner Leinbach to Commissioner Rivera, and welcome everyone. Again, through the last year, through the pandemic, through 2020, we learned a lot. Uh, immediately after that election in November, we had three successive Fridays that we spent three or four hours together as an internal team, looking at internal processes, also hearing from the public, from our co-workers, and Ron and his team have really put together uh, some really uh, critical changes that were needed going through those elections. We have a great panel here this afternoon. We have it led by Ron Rakowski, our new Director of Election Services, maybe not so new. Uh, after 90 days, you're no longer new. Uh, Donna Blatt, Chief Registrar. Ann Norton, our Election Projects Coordinator. Robert Quinter III, our Elections Project Coordinator. And Silvia Gutierrez, our HAVA Support Coordinator. And they will be addressing uh, actually, Rob and Ron will be going through the PowerPoint presentation, but the panel will be here to answer questions that will be coming through on the email. Uh, they will be such as who can vote during the primary election or for what races, where drop boxes will be, locations and hours, why is it so important to vote in the municipal primary election, mail-in and absentee voting request uh, based on 2021 versus 2020, and then questions and concerns from the public about elections, legislative issues, countywide issues, local issues, and anything else that wants to be brought forth germane to the primary uh, of May 18th. So without further ado, I want to turn this over to Ron Rakowski, uh, who will lead this panel. And then uh, when he's done with his PowerPoint presentation, open up the questions. Thank you. Thank you all three commissioners this is a great opportunity and it is exciting times and luckily commissioner rivera hit some key points so i'm i'm going to be able to slide through a couple of these slides really quick no i'm just kidding um we had really the opportunity to say municipal primary who can vote and just going over the agenda who can vote during this we want to mention drop boxes we want to emphasize, re-emphasize the municipal elections and what are they and how important are they? Review of the mail-in. The let's review is those concerns and looking to adjourn by 4.30. We do have a class scheduled after this, so we're going to move along pretty quickly. So who can vote? All registered voters in the county can vote for this election. And the reason I say that is there are four questions, amendment questions from the state that are given additional voters. So door, normally during a primary, a two party system, Democrats will vote for their Democratic candidates. Republicans will vote for their Republican candidates. With this municipal primary, the four questions any other party can vote for this election, whether they're walking in, whether they do a provisional, whether they do a mail-in or an absentee. The difference with this primary is as voters go into the polling place, machine operators are getting instructions that they will have three distinct cards, one, call, one with Democrat, one with Republican, and that third one other, which they will allow that individual to vote on the machines. So office races, we processed over 600 candidates through this office that includes your statewide and that's at a higher level. Your judges, Superior Court, Commonwealth, your justices of the Supreme Court, Court of Common Pleas, we have countywide. Your coroners, prothonotary and treasurer. The local races are really the crux. And as Commissioner Rivera alluded to, it is so important for people to go out and make a difference, whether it's a school race, whether it's a municipality, commissioner, supervisor, auditor, your tax collectors, your constables, 
this is part of the municipal primary race that we're talking about. And of course, the four questions. We also talked about drop boxes. Similar to the fall election, we will have drop box at two locations. Our services center that our primary normal business hours eight to five, the agricultural center that is in Vern Township. We will start these on May 3rd with normal business hours. And of course, running up to the election on May 18th, we'll have the extended hours as shown on the screen Saturday the 15th from eight to one. Monday the 17th, we will have eight to eight. And then, and then Tuesday, which is also the last day that any mail-ins or absentees can be dropped off in the office or at one of the drop locations. And that is postmarked by 8 p.m. So I wanted to really touch base on the, the four questions, four amendment questions. The first two really are dealing with the Pennsylvania Constitution and amendments to change the existing laws and the power increasing the power of the General Assembly when there is a uh, disaster emergency declaration for the state. So the first question deals with specifically that. The second question deals with should the declaration, emergency declaration automatically expire after 21 days? The third deals with the prohibition against denial of equality of rights because of race and ethnicity. And then the fourth is giving the question whether municipal fire and emergency medical services companies can be eligible or should be eligible for loans. So then going into what Commissioner Rivera had alluded to, the importance really of municipal elections is to get our grassroots, get our individual, our voters, the ability to run for school boards. Right now, it seems like the, the highly contested races are with the school boards, what's going on in the schools. And to see the number of candidates, I've seen as high as eight in one of the school districts. And that's phenomenal because there's excitement, there's interest, there's people that want to become part of making a difference in their child. The same goes true to the municipalities. And how do we make that difference? How do we get involved, get our voices involved? And where we see a higher voter turnout, like we did last year with presidential, nearly 80%. If we're hoping at best to get 20%, there's a, there's a grave disparity there. And the only way we're gonna make that change is to get out and vote. As far as votes go, and just a quick comparison, last year we processed over 80,000 absentee and mail-in ballots, applications that went out. What came back was 65, 66,000. This year through April 27th, we're only at about 15,000 applications that have come in. And you, you just got to wonder why, why is there such a disparity? And it's of concern. So if the message can be made through this publication, the message is let's get out and vote. It's important. And if you hear your neighbor knocking on the door, hey, I'm running for school board, or hey, I'm doing this or this or this, listen to them, see what they have to say, make a difference in, in in the election for the primary. So the getting into then what I really wanted to is and Commissioner Leinbach pointed perfectly. There was questions. There was concerns. There were issues that what can we do to make a difference? With these next couple of slides, we compiled all the data. This is data, like I said, from the parties, from the poll workers, from the citizens, from our rovers, from our department, and broke them into areas of le legislation, 
countywide, local and others. And I'll explain as I get into each one of those. So legislation basically is what's coming down from Harrisburg and the Commonwealth and the decisions that are made. Some of those were questions of, wait, non-US citizens registered to vote? Well, the process really is as you go and apply for your voter registration form, there's clearly a question on that that says, are you a United States citizen? If that registrant checks yes, they're signing a legal affirmation that they are a US citizen. With the help of the HAVA Act, Help American Vote Act, Every new registrant must pass that HAVA ID information. If, this, if they do not pass that HAVA, they will be sent a form to provide and complete and verify. If that form does not come back, obviously they're not voting. If that form comes back without the proper notification and verification, then again, we are not going to register those or have them registered. What about inactive voters? And Rob, do you want to jump in on this one and the next one, please? Uh, Ron, if I can just jump in, I want to make sure I understand. Every new registered voter goes through the HAVA system, and HAVA ostensibly is looking at uh, citizenship, or is it broader than that? HAVA, HAVA is going to, the, the HAVA Act cross checks um, with the either your last four of your social security with your birth date, your name, uh, or your driver's license number. There's multiple agencies that it uses to verify that information. And HAVA is determining whether they are a legitimate voter, which includes US citizenship. Correct. Okay. Because this is a question I was asked many times, not about HAVA, but are we able to check it? And when I asked, they said, we have no way of checking that ourselves, which is correct, but the HAVA system does. Correct. Okay, that's important. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, so as far as inactive voters goes, and this this was a concern that was brought up, that, that oftentimes our roles are inflated. Um, we have to follow the state's guidelines, the state law on removing these inactive voters. We, we can't just go through and say they haven't voted in two years, they're off the list. Um, so after one federal election cycle, four years, uh, the voter is sent what's called a five-year mailing. That goes out to the voter's address that we have on record. It either comes back to us undeliverable, which keeps them inactive, gets them ready to be removed um, the next year. The um, if they send it back saying, hey, all the information is correct, will they stay on the rolls? There's no there's no requirement to actually vote to stay on the voter rolls. Uh, as long as you respond to any correspondence we send you, it's your right to stay registered. There's no qualification. There's no requirement to vote every election, um, which then takes us into the removal of the deceased voters. So we have multiple ways. Um, the we receive bi-monthly updates from the Department of Health that's notifying us of any deceased individuals. You have the um, forms that can be filled out on election day. If a voter goes and they see their father still on the roll, they can notify the poll worker uh, that their father had passed or their relative had passed. They can fill that out. We can remove it that way. Um, the sure system have, and we'll get into it a bit later uh, into the specifics, but the sure system does have qualifications for removing those deceased voters. It's not as simple as just us receiving a phone call uh, and being able to remove that voter just because you could have a disgruntled neighbor calling in um, to, to remove, you know, out of a grudge. So we have to be careful on how we do that because we don't want a voter going to vote on election day and find out they've been marked as deceased. All right. Thanks, Rob. No problem. So just real quick, circling back to the ballot box and the availability, the hours that we showed, we all also want to point out these ballot boxes are guarded with deputy sheriffs, the hours that were provided to make assurance that one vote 
is being placed and then that is that individual. If there's a process called harvesting where someone will show up and try to put 10 ballots in there, there is a form that needs to accompany each one of those ballots if somebody is going to bring in multiples and dropping them off and the sheriff's deputies are there to, to, to monitor that. There's also a chain of possession. So at the end of a given day, there will be two individuals from this office that walk out, serve for the case here in the services center out, and there will be checks and balances. There will be recordings of how many ballots are taken out there of the box, record them and bring them back into the office. Similar to the agricultural center, two individuals will go count the ballots, have signatures, have the counts, and bring them back to the office to be secured for when they get opened up on election day. Rob, do you want to jump in on the uh, satellite offices? So the satellite offices is a concern that's that's nothing new. It's been tossed around um, for years. Um, there are positives to it. A lot of people don't like coming into the city. Uh, they would prefer to have a location outside of the, the city limits that they can go to. Parking's more accessible, you know, all valid points. Um, it would increase community involvement. You know, any we could cast a, a larger net uh, and, and have more voter outreach, which would then give us the increased voter participation that, that we really want to see. Uh, th there are challenges to it uh, as far as, you know, look at last year, for example, with the staffing requirements in the office with how many hours were being put in. It, it's essential that oftentimes the staff is together to be able to coordinate and work. Um, and then it's all about location, location, location. We could put one out at the North Campus, but that doesn't help the uh, eastern side of Berks County, you know, the border town, Colebrookdale area, where they're still going to have to drive 45 miles to even get to downtown uh, Reading to the office. And then we put it another 20 miles out at the Ag Center and it, it doesn't help them. Um, so that that's something to, to consider. Yeah. Rushing over to where the overall policy and the assessment of the policies and procedures for the department as, as a whole. It should be known that the policies and procedures of this office, that's an ongoing change as legislation, legislative updates are coming out of the state election codes. What we intend to do as a department multiple times of the year. Get together and really sit down and look at what we're currently doing. I have a great opportunity new coming into this this department to learn so much and the staff that is here that have been here know what these policies and procedures are and follow them. How do we how do we make them better? The change in personnel is a, another perfect example. The last piece is also is driven by the Board of Elections. And what can we really submit to the board and say, hey, this is what we can do, do differently. I mentioned the personnel, um, something as simple as forms from our poll workers. If it's so cumbersome, on election day that there's a mile of paperwork that they're dealing with. How do we streamline it? How do we make it better? One of our poll workers says, you know what? The certification form that you provide to us, we're jumping from point A to B to C to D to E all over the page. And we simplified it. The last couple of trainings that we've gone to, we've shared this and you can see the eyes light up that those are improvement. Those are small incremental steps, but they're huge improvements to the process as a whole. We talked about the changing from paying poll workers by checks. On some cases, last minute changes, there's a poll worker that shows up that doesn't get paid till two weeks later. 
and the board approved the, the debit cards. It's a, it's a Visa card that we will be implementing this year, and we have more flexibility with that. But it also then reduces some of the costs. So those are those are positive improvements going forward. Um, Rob, the, the other one was you know dealing with um, some of the number of votes that weren't accounted for. Which Correct. Is, sorry, I didn't move the slide. That's what I was looking for. So if you want to touch base on that, please. So there was an incident in the uh, general election of last year where one of the larger precincts in the area, specifically Exeter 8, was given two tabulators to try to ensure a smooth flow at the polling place on election day so that we could get voters in and out quickly. Uh, it's unusual that two of these tabulators would be sent out to the polling places. So the next day when these results are the, the night of the election, when the supplies are returned and, and the results are starting to be uploaded, uh, one stick from Exeter 8 was not read. Uh, but in the course of the days following, because of the policies and procedures where we're checking everything, not once, not twice, but thrice, uh, it was recognized that this one stick was missed. Um, before it was even put on social media where it became a thing, we had already counted it. Uh, we were completely transparent with the error. Um, but because of those policies and procedures, it, it was a perfect example of that working, our own checks and balances and the way this department chooses to conduct uh, the campus. So by the time it was an issue, it had already been rectified. If I can interject, isn't it also true that as a result of this, you've updated your uh, policy uh, relative to when you have two tabulators uh, at a precinct. Correct. So it's really only something you're going to see in presidential years when, when we're expecting that 80% turnout. Better records will be kept in the future. I think it was a last minute decision for this tabulator to go out. Uh, and it's not something on election night that we or the staff are used to looking for these two um, USB sticks. It was a simple oversight. Uh, but like I said, by the time it was brought on social media and it became a thing, it had already been taken care of. So when the candidate contacted us, we were very forthcoming about it. We were very open about it. Transparency is our goal. Uh, and the, the issue was solved by that point. Thanks, Rob. Well, so I want to circle back to the judge of elections and the machine operators because of COVID. They are the main emphasis of our training. And I can't say it enough, training, training, training. Even though this is our second one on third year with the machines, as we're learning, the important part is the judge of election is a body at the precinct that really oversees and has to understand all aspects of that. So what we've been doing is something as simple as giving a manual during training that they can take home, but then election day, they'll get a, a colored manual for them to really look at and train and retrain and, and retrain any aspects. Constant phone calls that come into the office. Hey, I was reading over this and I wasn't quite clear what you meant. The I already mentioned the implication of some of the paperwork. Something as simple as at the end of the day, with all this paperwork, what are we doing with this? And if there's a check, a simple checklist that we can add to, I'm getting feedback. Sorry. If we, if it's a simple form that we can add at the end of the day that they can simplify, it's an 18-hour day. It's a 15-hour day. It's a long day and they need less confusion and we're working on that. Conversely, or in addition to the machine operator themselves, we're finding better ways to train them. They'll also get the same type of manual. And it's funny because we go through the training and there's, there's four real key chapters for their manual. The first one is how to open. The second one is how do they process the voter when it comes in, when they have a Democrat or they have a Republican or they have another. 
The third is their most important is how to close at the end of the day, chapter 11. And then chapter 12 is the one that are giving them little tips of the trade to how to, to clear a jam or where to look for it. Well, what's the error message that might come up that if it's a phone call back to the office or a technician, we are going to have them troubleshoot to some minor degree, but it's going to be an assistance in the field to really to walk through and get those machines up and running so much quicker. Moving over to an interpreters. Sylvia, as she's going through her training, the positive feedback, just the, the thought of here, here's Sylvia working for the department for 12 years and now is in a, in a role that she reaches out to the community. She provided me with a report the other day. It was a, a summary and just phenomenal, you know, the feedback that I'm getting. Her presentations for the training, putting a presentation together, it's so much cleaner and easier to follow. And I look and I talk to the interpreters and they're so pleased, they're so excited. They, they're energized to see such newness and excitement in the department itself and bringing these new type of things. Call center is an integral part where as we have 10 rovers and we have four technicians in the field, as we have 202 precinct boards, sometimes it's still not enough. And the call center is more important during the presidential because of the number of calls and the concerns that are coming in, but it's still an integral part that we can take and we can make it even better. And we, we are making it better. And to note, with significant transitions that have occurred within our department, like I said, it isn't anticipated that most concerns and issues are alleviated, will be alleviated. And as new ones come up, we are addressing them professionally, timely, and with respect for the concerns of many people. It was it was just brought to light that says, okay, somebody with a walking list, are they how, how do they use that? Common sense would say your walking list is used to find who you want to target in your area. If it's used for something other than that, can we really control that? There's no state law that says, but those are areas of concerns that we're drilling, we're dealing with and looking at on a continuous basis. So the machines themselves, <laughs> excuse me, the express vote as we have it, and we, what we call it is our printer. This election, we we were concerned that with all the candidates on the list and the questions, our 14 inch ballots may not have worked successfully. We weren't gonna take that chance. We actually got a 17 inch ballot. So as people receive their mail-in votes or their absentee, you'll see the form is a little bigger than normal. Still eight and a half, but it's 17 inches. The same with the ballot cards as you go to the precinct. And they are programmed, both the express vote and the DS200 machines are programmed in this office. Each of the military grade encrypted USBs do not touch or connect to an internet, internet in any way, shape or form. The computer that the programs are developed on do not touch the internet. The USB port, um, USB sticks are then delivered to the warehouse where each one of those machines containing that precinct, that specific precinct, rating 1-1, rating 18-1, goes into those specified machines. Depending on the number of voters in that individual precinct, is how many express votes they receive. So a card of four, I'll call it a quad, could have three, could have two. And some locations may just have a tabletop or a very small part. Those are all in, integrated with its own individual USB stick for these machines. 
There are no Wi-Fi or Ethernet cards on those as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I if I can jump in again, sure. because I know this has been an ongoing issue. Yes, sir. There is absolutely no way these scanners and the scanners are the uh, units that tabulate the votes connect to the internet any way, shape or form. The, the tabulator does not connect. There's no Bluetooth, there's no Wi-Fi, there's no ethernet, there's no possible hardwire or uh, Wi-Fi connection for, for the tabulator. The tabulators, what the person touches to mark their ballot and once we implement later this year the electronic poll books the electronic poll books are not tied into the internet etc cetera, etc cetera, and none of the units are tied to each other correct the machines that we currently have which i just went backwards the express vote and the ds 200s you are correct the ds 450s which is the tally machines are not connected to the internet there's no, and maybe I don't know the technical term, the cards, ethernet cards or access are in these machines that we purchased. They've been taken out completely. And I know because we were in the same meeting, Ron, mm -hmm. but we need to reiterate that. I know that that is still out there. I'm hearing it from individuals that uh, continue to make that claim and that is simply not the case. Correct. So you also mentioned the e-poll books, but that's something that we need to look at. There are functionalities that, when we visited uh, Delaware, there was some functionality, but we are not interested in that, that it would connect to um, a MiFi. Right, and, the, and let's just clarify, the idea behind, in some states, they connect e-poll books uh, to the internet, and nothing else. And the e poll, th what that would stop is if Christian Leinbach thinks he's going to vote twice and he goes to Tilden Township in the morning and he votes. And then uh, in the evening, I go to downtown Reading and I try to vote again. The e poll book that is connected, which ours will not be a, 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 at this uh, juncture, we're not planning to do that. Right. Uh, it would immediately say, wait a minute, this person already checked in at Tilden Township. That's the reason that some poll books would be connected to the internet. Correct. The state of Delaware also uses that feature through ES and S to track on a moment's notice the number of voters that are actually coming out. It's a tracking. Okay gross number of voters, you know, hey, we have 30%, we have 40%. And again, it's to cross reference to make sure you're not trying to vote in two different places. Yep. But again, we're not doing that. No. Know the hesitancy on Wi-Fi. That's something that can be, not Wi-Fi, on connecting them. It's something we can look at uh, down the road. Uh, but right now, it's just to speed up the process of checking in and to have a very reliable uh, electronic check-in system that literally that night uh, we will know who checked in and voted in person on election day, which now takes weeks Correct. to verify. Good point. Thank you. So looking over at the potential scanning errors due to repetitive scanning and to just to touch base with the DS200 tabulator, there is a counter that's on that machine itself that is checked. And we keep emphasizing to the poll workers, that count should match the tally that the clerk is recording on a daily basis, enough said. If we're looking at the 450, the DS450, that's actually doing the mail-in ballots, and there's three trays on that machine itself. The top tray really is for any type of a misfeed. If there's a tear, if there's a coating over the bar strips around the outside, it's going to go on the top as a misfeed and it has to be looked at. The middle tray is going to be ballots that were processed 
and they have write-in on the ballot itself. And then the bottom is for those, all those ballots that have been processed through the normal filling in the circle and um, processing through. So I know there was a, a misconception. I'm hoping that the top slot, wait, that went through the machine and now you're putting it back in the top. Well, there's a process for that. And then again, if there was a tear, um, actually even the creases as they fold them, trifold them, and the bar strips that are down the side and around the outside of that. If that crease is hitting that bar, it may give a misfeed. And that's where the operator then would need to look at that and make a determination. Uh, reliability of the machines themselves. I want to change that wording there from operator error. It really is voter error if they're not putting the right information on the ballot out of the express vote or as they're trying to feed it into the tabulator, it's a misfeed. Most of, and I, I won't give a percentage, but most of it is because of just not familiarity with the machines and we're still learning that as well. These machines had gone through the last couple of weeks, maintenance test on each one of the express votes and the DS 200. We had preventive maintenance is also on our DS 450s. There is also LNA testing done on the warehouse machines, the Voter Express and the DS 200s. We are scheduling to do an LA, LNA testing tomorrow at one o'clock in the commissioner's boardroom for the DS 450. And LNA, uh, LNA stands for? Logistics and Accuracy. Okay. All right. Rob, do you want to touch base on the security suite, please? So there were concerns that there was no security sweeps done at the Doubletree uh, before the counting and processing of the mail-in ballots down there on Election Day. Uh, concerns that ballots might be hit. That's a logistical nightmare because the final count uh, of the tallied votes would not match the records. Uh, the number of ballots returned, which as soon as a ballot comes in, it's scanned. It might not be counted for you know another two weeks, but as soon as that ballot comes in the mail, we scan it. There's record that it's here. Those numbers would not match. Um, it, 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 to, we, we don't, most of us do not see the results on election day until the canvas is done. Uh, so to go through and to try to switch these votes and make them mat, it, it's a logistical nightmare and, and quite frankly, it's it's not a concern or a possibility. Uh, and thanks, Rob. I want to add to that, that the pre-audit of the mail-in and absentee ball ballots are done in this office. So we will have a pre-audit knowing what's here as far as numbers and counts that will be shrink wrapped, sealed before it's transported over to the arena for the count. We will have secure BCTV doing a video and we also will have the sheriff's deputies accompanying us when we go to do the tallies. It will be done done on the Santander arena floor. As the precincts were moved to the concourse, we're going to have the whole floor that we're going to put that in place. Now, last section is general generalities. Rob? Yeah, so there was um, some concern of unprofessional conduct by some of the um, helpers that helped us process those mail-in ballots. I do not know specifics, uh, but I will tell you that um, professionalism is, you know, number one to the county of Berks, and any actions that were noticed should have been brought to one of the supervisors down there, and it would have been handled immediately. Uh, there were concerns of suspicious voting where they were saying, you know, first time voters who are, you know, up there in age or they, they haven't voted frequently. And as I said earlier, there, there's absolutely no requirement uh, to vote regularly, nor is it uncommon for people of all age to turn out for these presidential elections that have never voted. It's in the media. It's pounded into them. They want to be involved. Um, we welcome anybody, it, you know, any qualified voter to come out and vote regardless of age. You don't have to vote every year. You can vote every four years if that's your interest. We would love to see a huge voter turnout, but unfortunately, you know, that's everyone's prerogative. You have the right to vote how you wish.
you want to you want to continue with yeah um, so the um there was a big concern in, where they were saying that the precinct precincts had registration numbers higher than eligible voters meaning what they had on record of the population of those uh, one of the precincts that was at the top of that list was 175. So 175 is Albright College. So they were saying there was over 200% of the population registered there. So census data would not include college students because they're still using their home addresses as their permanent addresses. So even though they're at college, they're not they're not putting that on their census data that that is their permanent residence. So unfortunately, when students leave college, you also have the issue of they forget to either cancel their registration in Berks County, they would be put on that five year mailing list. Um, or we have another mailer called an NCOA, uh, which is basically the post office letting us know that this address may have changed. So that's another thing that we send out uh, and we will send those to any state. We will send them to any address on record trying to get confirmation that voter no longer resides in Berks County. Uh, with 17.5, 100% of the student body ages 17 to 25 are required to live on campus, but the campus is actually split between two precincts. You have 17.5 and uh, the college campus, which is 13.5 where the main building is. So some of the students register at their dorm rooms and some register at the, uh, the mail, their mailboxes in the main building. So that would affect those numbers. Berks County, we've got what, five colleges in Berks County with a huge population of people coming from out of state, they certainly have the right to register and vote at college. There's nothing that says they have to vote by mail in their home precinct. Uh, that, you know, that's where we're seeing these indiscrepancies in numbers that bring up the concern. You have to look at what's in the precinct, whether it's Penn State Perks, Albright, Alvernia, you know, students living off campus at Brack, it's it Kutztown, it's, it's what we deal with. So those numbers are often explained if you just stop and look at what's going on in those precincts. Okay, that's the crux of what we have prepared, what we have reviewed, and I want to thank my team for <laughs> pushing me through this and keeping me straight on some points. And it's a challenge, but it's a fantastic challenge and I look forward to whatever questions, if there are any at this point. Ron, I wanna thank you and your staff for a tremendous presentation. Uh, it just goes to show you how much minute detail goes into a process. Uh, people kind of scoff at the idea, well, it's only twice a year, how much work can there be involved? Well, you're rolling from one election to another, you're backtracking, you're going forward. There's just so much that goes on. Uh, planning these two major events in our community. I want to thank you and your staff for the great job you continue to do uh, for the voters in Berks County. Uh, we do have questions, so Jesse, if you wouldn't mind reading those and Ron and his uh, staff could be happy to answer those. John Archer, Spring Township. Regarding inflated voter registration rolls, approximately how many reg registrants are being removed per year in accordance with the state and federal election regulations? The, the number that I could come up with, and we just did this for Office of Controller that puts it together. For 2020, there was just over 9,300 registrants removed in 2020. I don't have studies that shows a tracking over the previous years. Thank you. Risa Marmentello, Amity Township. Perhaps you covered this. Have mail-in ballots been mailed out yet? Oh, I didn't. I just got notification about an hour ago. They're through the production and they are, they will be in the mail by the end of the today. And that, those numbers, like I said earlier, it was about 15,000 mail-in and absentee ballots that should be arriving at those that requested it. And they're being mailed out through a mail service, correct, Ron? That is correct. And they'll be postmarked from where then? I want to say Minnesota. Okay. There are no other questions in the Q&A um, box. Okay. 
Well, as always, our election services team is there to help. If there are any questions that people have, uh, we did have open the screen. Their number is 610-478-6490, elections at countyofburks.com. And uh, they're more than willing and able to answer any questions people have about the upcoming primary. And tomorrow is a uh, board of election meeting at 11 a.m. where we will formally vote uh, to support the two drop boxes in the hours, some extended hours uh, toward the end of the process on a Saturday and then the Monday of the primary. And uh, we're also going to approve three additional alternate voting precincts still having issues with uh, accessibility because of COVID-19. So I have a total of 18 different poll locations. Again, we'll still have 202 but 18 will be not in their normal place, which is going into year two of not being in the normal place. So uh, that will be tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Uh, if I'm sorry, Ron, go ahead. If I could just reiterate, sure. we have about 12, 15 judge of election positions open throughout the county and poll workers themselves, we're still down a couple hundred. So I encourage anybody that's listening, tap your neighbor on the shoulder, says, come on, it's a good day. Let's go have fun. There you go. I don't know if my colleague Commissioner Linebox on, but I know Commissioner Rivera is. Anything you would like to add, uh, Commissioner Rivera? Yeah, uh, Ron, question. How many uh, interpreters do you need yet, or do you have them all? The Sylvia, do you want to answer that, please? Uh, sure, right now we have a total of 55 interpreters. Um, we're still looking for backups, which we typically have about 10 backups in the office. We need 10. Correct. Okay, so 10 more. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. I just want to thank Ron and his team uh, for putting this together, very uh, educational. Sylvia and I did a program in Spanish, actually came out just this uh, past Monday on one of the radio stations here. So we want to continue to get out the information as much as we can to make sure that people are educated on the process and, and know are aware of the time frame so that they don't miss the time frames and so we can get as many people out to vote as we can on on May 18th. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rivera. And you see what a dedicated team we have here at Berks County. It uh, yeah. does a hard glad to know that you have people who really uh, slug away day in and day out to make sure this thing is as smooth as silk uh, come May 18th. So thank you again, Ron, to you and your staff and to my colleagues for another uh, good weekly update here. Uh, so with that, uh, we will sign off and enjoy the rest of your beautiful day. Commissioner? Yes. I'm sorry, there is one more comment. Case. Oh, I was so looking. That, I, 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 yeah, one more comment came I'm through. Sorry. If you'd like me to read that. Go ahead, please. Dwight Wegman, Lower Heidelberg Township. One analysis of voter rolls in Berks County indicated that 35 precincts had voter rolls exceeding the eligible population. The college example does not answer all of these inflated voter rolls. This clearly requires more investigation. If I may, uh, it's it's not just colleges. Um, I, I have the list of the precincts where the voter where the we're seeing these high numbers. Uh, it's there's also retirement homes. If these individuals still own property, they have no obligation to register at the retirement home. They they can continue voting in the precinct where they own property, whether that be in a separate county or a separate state. There is no requirement for them to update their voter registration. Uh, that looking at all of them, it's either colleges or a retirement home seems to be the brunt of it. I, I specifically went through this data myself. Thank you. I do see one other one, Bill Lippin. How many drop off locations will be there for this election? And again, we've mentioned that twice now. There will be two here at the Services Center and one at the Ag Center, same as we did in the general election of 2020. Starting on May 3rd, they will be opened. All right. Okay. All right. Sorry, they, they came in there at the last minute. I didn't really see them. I'm clicking back and forth on the Q&A. I didn't see them, so I'm sorry about that. 
Okay. Uh, enjoy you. enjoy your day, everyone, and uh, get the work, guys, down there in election services. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Bye. 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 Take care.